Hello. Good morning, everybody. I would like to welcome you all with open arms and legs. Uh, my name is Eli, and this is Murder in the Morning. So, have you guys watched To Catch a Killer yet? So good. So, so good. With Shailene Woodley, Aaron Rodgers' ex from the Packers. Just a little fun fact for you. But in all honesty, like one of my favorite fake true crime movies I've watched in a long time. Very, 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 very good. Anyways, at the moment... I'm currently sitting down in Starbucks right now, writing this with sweat dripping off of my back, either from too much espresso or the fact that their AC is turned off on an 80 degree day. But that's neither here nor there. Today, I've got a little bit of a mystery for you. And I know that I said in the past, I'm not the biggest fan of cold cases. And this still remains true, but the story today feels a bit different. Unlike all those other dead-end investigations out there that continue to puzzle and frustrate you and me alike. I actually believe that this is solvable, and I know I'm not the only one. Now, I don't know if I'm more or less frustrated by this concept that I think we can solve it, but without a doubt, it makes me that much more intrigued. And with the 25th year anniversary coming up next summer, in fact, I thought, why not? So my sources today... Essentially, most of my information was from an All That Is Interesting article by Neil Patmore, um, a Morbidology article from Emily G. Thompson, and then the rest I'll just put in uh, Misa notes down below. Okay, so our conundrum begins June 30th, 1999. There was a woman driving along a highway in West Alton, Missouri, roughly 20 miles outside of St. Louis. She had glanced out of her window and noticed something in a nearby field. As she got closer to inspect the object, it wasn't uh, it wasn't long before she realized that this quote object was in fact a dead body. So this body, forty one year old Ricky McCormick, was found dead and decomposing in a cornfield. It was reported that he was quote wearing dirty Lee blue jeans and a stained white T shirt. The body was in such an advanced state of decomposition that the flesh on his hands had rotted to the extent that his fingertips had fallen off and lay in the foliage beside the body, end quote. So as surprised as, as this lady must have been to find the man, investigators weren't so much. Apparently, according to the articles, this wasn't the first time police had come across bodies in the area. Just four years previous, a sex worker had been found shot and killed along the same exact roadway. But that's just a little bit extra for you. It doesn't actually pertain to this case other than that close similarity. So at first glance, and even after further analysis of Ricky's body, investigators were dumbfounded. Due to the nature of decomposition, the coroner was unable to determine a specific cause of death. And unfortunately, this resulted in the announcement that, quote, Ricky had died of natural causes, despite the peculiar nature of death, end quote. However, investigators were almost certain that Ricky was a victim, not of natural causes, but of foul play. Captain David Tiefenbrunn, I believe, the Bureau Commander of Criminal Investigations for the St. Charles County Police Department said this in an interview, quote, it's kind of a puzzling case. If I was to rely on my police instincts, then there is probably some kind of foul play. We just haven't been able to prove it, end quote. But why? This was a poor black man with a criminal history in 1999. Not really the typical case that the media, or police for that matter, no offense, would normally go crazy about, or even spend time uh, investigating. But this case blew up for one major reason and just continued to get weirder from there. So inside the pockets of Ricky McCormick, police had found two encrypted handwritten notes which almost immediately gave me the summer the summer tin man vibes. Um, so it was super intriguing right off the bat for everyone involved. 
Um, I mean, intriguing, puzzling, frustrating, you name it. Now, this is Missouri's in the 1990s. I'm not sure they had a cryptology department in-house yet, so they actually reached out to the F- FBI's Cryptanalysis and Racketeering Records Unit, or CRRU, for help, and they sent these encrypted messages along. So the chief of the CRRU, uh, he had said in an interview that, quote, it doesn't happen often here that we have an unsolved cipher of this length and significance. The characters are not random. There are many E's, for example, that could be used as a spacer. There are many characteristics that suggest it could be solved, many patterns. The problem is, we don't know why it is not solvable. Breaking the code could reveal the victim's whereabouts before his death and could lead to the solution of a homicide. Not every cipher we get arrives at her door under those circumstances. End quote. Before we go any further, um, I just if you haven't actually seen photos of these yet, I highly recommend you just do a quick five second Google search because you'll understand a lot more of all the points that I, I'm about to go through throughout this whole story. Um, you might be intrigued by them. You might not. Really depends on what kind of, what kind of person you might be. Anyways. That's kind of why I like this case. To me, this crime is, it's like when you drop a pencil on the floor and it just disappears into oblivion. It's just waiting there for you to find it, like sitting, waving at you, and you just can't see it. So when the FBI got this, what did they do? Um, They approach essentially, or this unit, the CCRU unit, approaches every puzzle the same way. And I want to share with you the FBI's process of unencrypting secret codes or messages. I thought originally it would be a long and complex system, but it's very much the opposite. And this comes directly from the FBI's government website. So they say that, quote, breaking any code involves four basic steps. Number one, determining the language used, like English, for example. Number two, determining the system used. Number three, reconstructing the key. And then number four, reconstructing the text, end quote. And this is essentially the same four steps they use to approach, like I said, every puzzle they they come across. Unfortunately, unlike in most cases, investigators were apparently unable to ever get past step two for these Ricky McCormick encrypted messages. Step two is determining the system used. So they can never get past that. And then they can never reconstruct the key or the text itself and their SOL. And the case hits a brick wall. No evidence on the body and no way forward with the encryptions. So the police start to look backward. Who was Ricky and what did his final days look like before his death? So sometimes and sadly referred to as, quote, the boy with the brick wall in his brain, Ricky seemed to have it rough from the get-go. He was born in June of 1958 and people soon realized that he was very different. At school, he would stand alone quietly, act strangely, and when he did speak out, he would tell just weird stories. His cousin went on record saying that it was like he was in another world some of the time, referencing uh, schizophrenia, schizophrenia as a possibility. His mother, on the other hand, she was much less kind in her description. She simply told the press that she believed her son to be, quote, Uh, Well, she uses the R word. And even Ricky's uh, psychiatrist was cruel enough to say that he had a brick wall in his brain, hence the awful, cruel nickname. The only person actually that seemed to respect Ricky was his aunt Gloria, who went by Cookie. And she told the newspaper, quote, Ricky didn't like the life of living poor and had a very active imagination, end quote. So it just kind of seemed like, at least as a child, he had a positive outlook even if others thought he was kind of weird. And as he grew, unfortunately, life did not get any easier for Ricky. He ended up dropping out of school without learning to read or write properly. Quote, lacking a high school degree, McCormick worked a number of menial jobs, usually on the night shift. He subsisted on his meager paychecks as well as the disability payments he received for his chronic heart disease. But in 1992, McCormick got in trouble with the law. End quote. And this, it seems, is kind of when his, quote, odd behavior finally catches up to Ricky. At the age of 34, he was charged with statutory rape of a girl younger than 14, which isn't so much odd as it is gross. And before his arrest, he had actually impregnated this girl twice already. 
So he ends up pleading guilty, and it seems due to his apparent mental health struggles, only spent 13 months at a correctional facility. After his release, and shortly before his death, the troubles only seemed to grow. <clears throat> so as time went on, Ricky managed to get hired at a, it's either a MoCo or Amoco gas station owned by two brothers, Juma and Bob. However, these two men were seemingly involved in much more than just gas, and both had, quote, violent reputations. So during his employment there, Ricky took multiple trips to and from Florida, doing exactly what is unknown. But people close to Ricky speculate that he was smuggling or trafficking marijuana for the two brothers um, that owned the gas station. During his final week alive in mid-June, Ricky took one final round trip down to Florida. It was at this point people started to note even more strange behavior by Ricky. After returning from Florida, he went to an emergency room on June 22nd, complaining of chest pains, but was turned away. Three days later, on the 25th, he tried again at a different ER, and this time he was admitted. Unfortunately, we, do, we uh, don't know anything about what transpired inside the hospital, or if he was even treated for anything. I've seen a speculation that he was just receiving medication for a heart issue, but I'm not sure why he would have been turned away if that's all he was doing at the original ER. I think uh, that this fact that he kept going to the hospital was m much more important to the case than we realize. Many people are focused on the encrypted messages, and rightfully so. But I need to know why Ricky's behavior suddenly escalated in, the, in these final days. Had this happened before? Uh, was he truly in need of medical help? Or was this just a, a weird episode of his? So two days later, on the 27th, Ricky, Ricky was seen working at the Amoco gas station. And then after that, he vanished. And for three entire days, no one had seen or heard from Ricky. Sadly, no one had reported him missing either. That is, until our lady from the beginning of the story drove past. Frustratingly, this is all that the investigators, investigators have to go on. A rough timeline leading up to his death, no cause of death, and two utterly insane encrypted notes. So Ricky's death remains unsolved. I mean, up until today, <clears throat> it remains unsolved. But don't worry, because here comes the fun part. Theories! I love a good conspiracy theory. I don't know about you. And this isn't so much conspiracy more than just a lot of people spouting their own opinions, but it's still fun. And since there is so much conjecture and mystery surrounding the messages, I just want to set two precedents. Um, one I'm taking directly from the family and then another from the FBI themselves. So number one, the family is confident in the fact that Ricky did not write those messages. In another interview with Esquire, the family stated that they, quote, expressed their doubts that McCormick was, a, <clears throat> was capable of writing in code. One family member said that McCormick didn't write in code. He couldn't spell anything, just scribble, end quote. And if you have seen these photos, it is much more than just a scribble. Number two, uh, which is my personal favorite, the FBI remains adamant that the messages in question are not random. Uh, the CCRU chief, Dan Olson, is quoted saying, We look at a lot of things that are gibberish, arbitrary strikes on a keyboard. This is not the case, end quote. That part makes me especially hopeful inside. Like, if after a decade plus of trying to solve this, just to find out it's nothing would be absolutely gut-wrenching. So anyways, here we go. The first theory is the two brothers. Again, renowned for their violence, the police look immediately at these two guys. And a few things stand out, like Ricky's mysterious trips to and from Florida while working for them or the fact that his behavior itself was shifting while under their employment. But to me, this part stands out the most. The brothers had no concern whatsoever and did not report him missing. I know Ricky's a grown man at this point, but he wasn't showing up to work, and he was the night attendant, so he kind of needs to be there. I feel like they would have made an effort to find the man. Theory number two is a local drug dealer who had previously been linked to a murder at the same Amico gas station. I assume this made sense to investigators for two reasons, the obvious one being a previous murder in the location Ricky was last seen alive, and second, 
if Ricky were involved in drug smuggling at all, he may have pissed off the wrong people at the wrong time. And again, unfortunately, police were unable to link any of those three men to Ricky's death, even while under police surveillance. So we get to theory number three, and this is Dan Olson's input rather than a theory, let's say. His belief is that the notes were written by Ricky. Quote, they are done in more of a format of something written to oneself than something written to someone else. He provided an example pointing out circles drawn around segments of code that he suggested was a to-do list where items are marked as tasks as completed. End quote. He's saying it looks to him more like obviously like a to-do list or like a grocery list or just like reminders for himself later in the day. But why have such complex code for that? And this unfortunately contradicts the family's belief that Ricky is incapable of writing those messages. But let's say this was true. Okay. Why suddenly now? Maybe his cousin all those years ago was correct. And Ricky had early signs of schizophrenia. And now this was coming into fruition That would explain the strange behavior, possibly the hospital visits. Um, Maybe he was seeing these encrypted messages in his head and they would make sense to him, but no one else. Now that's all complete conjecture of my own. So please take it with a grain of salt. And before I continue, I I probably should have noted this before, but I didn't. Ricky had been found dead almost 20 miles from where he lived. And the issue with this is that he didn't have a car. And no public transport went out to that area at all. So either he walked 20 miles on his own and then died, or someone else was out there with him. But who? These last few theories here, um, I I like them. They have much less to back up with evidence, but they're still possibly valid as a theory. So many people, including the FBI and amateur sleuths, believe that the encryptions are clues to the killer's identity and or whereabouts. As to why the killer would leave a clue, maybe it's a game to them, or maybe they like to see investigators struggling with this puzzle that goes nowhere. Theoretically, Ricky would be a classic victim of killers, an impoverished lower-class black man. Many minorities are still overlooked today as victims, not to mention in the 90s. Which leads us to our final theory. Ricky, possibly, was the unlikely target of a serial killer. According to a True Crime Zone article, quote, two years after his discovery, two more bodies were discovered in close proximity, leading many to conclude that the area was a prime body dumping spot, end quote. Now, I tried looking up any relevant information pertaining to those two bodies um, mentioned above, but could not find anything. Every Google search for unsolved murders near West Alton, Missouri, it just leads you to endless articles about the 1968 Jane Doe murder or the case of serial killer Maury Troy Travis, whom I definitely might have to do an episode on. And woefully, that is that. The case as of today remains unsolved, but investigators still remain hopeful, um, as well as the FBI, and so do I, honestly. Every year, this case gets more and more exposure as true crime continues to grow. Like so many cold cold cases out there, this could just be the next one that's solved. It's only a matter of time, right? Someone knows something. And this final quote from All That Is Interesting just kind of sums up the mystery of Ricky McCormick beautifully. Quote, were the notes a clue to his killing or something else entirely? Perhaps they were simply a shorthand that McCormick had invented decipherable only to him. Whatever they are, the FBI still wants to solve them. Even if we found out that he was writing a grocery list or a love letter, we would still want to see how the code is solved. End quote. As do I, damn it. Like, no matter if it leads us to the killer or not killer, I want to know what it says on the note. Maybe I'll ask my mom if she knows anything later today. Well, Uh, like always, I love you guys. Eat your crust. Goodbye.